Very good to see all of you this morning. If you would, open your Bibles to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, we will begin here this morning. You know, the Old Testament is full of accounts where God delivered His people from seemingly impossible circumstances. Often, in these circumstances, the people didn't deserve it. Either they are the ones who led themselves into that circumstance, or in the midst of it, they were filled with fear. They really didn't trust God like they should have trusted Him, or they are filled with doubt. They don't believe what God says about what will turn out or what is going to happen. We are given these things, these accounts in the Old Testament, so that our faith can be strengthened. As Romans 15 verse 4 says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scripture might have hope. That we have that firm conviction as we look forward to the blessing that God will ultimately give us with a home in heaven. There are a couple of amazing accounts of deliverance back in 2 Kings chapter 6 and 7. We began a study last week on these accounts found in 2 Kings 6 and 7. We noted Elisha's deliverance from the Assyrian troops that had surrounded the city of Dothan and his servant was worried, well, what do we do now? And Elisha prayed to God he would blind those troops. Those troops then were led into Samaria and then they were let go to go back to their homeland. We're going to go on now and notice how that there is a delivery that's given to the entire city of Samaria when they are found to be under siege by the Syrians. We will see that God's great power brought about this deliverance through the message that Elisha gave to the king and to the people that God would deliver them from this terrible situation. So let's go to 2 Kings chapter 6 and begin in verse 24. We want to read down through chapter 7 verse 2 in the first part of what is unfolding here. So 2 Kings chapter 6 verse 24. Let's read all the way down to chapter 7 verse 2. And it happened after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and indeed they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for eighty shekels of silver and one-fourth of a cab of dove droppings for five shekels of silver. Then as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord does not help you, where can I find help for you? From the threshing floor or from the winepress? Then the king said to her, What is troubling you? And she answered, This woman said to me, Give your son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her on the next day, Give your son that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the woman, that he tore his clothes, and as he passed by on the wall, the people looked, and there underneath he had sackcloth on his body. Then he said, God, do, to me, do so to me, and more also, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. But Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him, and the king sent a man ahead of him, but before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, do you see how the son of a murderer has sent someone to take away my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? And while he was still talking with them, there was the messenger coming down to him. And the king said, Surely this calamity is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Then Elisha said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord. Tomorrow about this time a seah of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. So an officer on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, 
could this thing be? And he said, In fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. So we see that when the siege came upon the city of Samaria, that it brought about a severe famine. That was very common in ancient times. If the invading army surrounds a city, then all the city essentially has is supplies in the city. And over time, those are going to run down and run out. They can't go out and get crops. They can't take care of the animals or get animals that are out in the field. And so they eventually run out of food and the situation becomes extremely dire as it talks about here. We see that food was at a premium in verse 25 where it talked about a donkey's head sold for 80 shekels and one-fourth or it's about a pint of a cab of dove droppings that is dove dung that it sold there for five shekels. Now a shekel, if I understand correctly, is worth about $12 in today's money. So you think about what that is. It's saying that a donkey's head sold for around $960, almost $1,000 for a donkey head. That's what you had to pay to have something to eat. And then a pint of dove droppings sold for about $60. Now both of these under the Old Testament law of course were unclean. But even if you set that aside, it's disgusting. The donkey's head is the worst part of the donkey to eat. If you have to eat any part of a donkey, the head is the worst. But they were willing to pay $960 to get that donkey head. Or they're willing to pay $60 for a pint of dove droppings. That's how bad it is. But then we're told, well, actually it's even worse than that. Because it talks about this incident of cannibalism. And how these two mothers had agreed with each other that they would eat their sons. And the first mother boiled her son. They divided him, ate him. The next day she goes to the other mother and says, we need your son, we need to eat again. But the other mother had hidden her son. And so that first mother complains to the king as he's coming along the wall, as he's inspecting things, how they are going. He's coming along the wall. She asked him, you know, won't you help me? He says, you know, I can't help you. The Lord's not helping you. How can I help you? Am I supposed to go to the threshing floor, the wine press? I, I can't help you. And then she tells that story, and he's so distraught that he tears his clothes, and it reveals he has sackcloth underneath. That means he's in severe grieving over what is happening in the city of Samaria to his people and that he himself is going through as well. Well then, he decides at this point, it's Elisha's fault. I've got to find someone to put the blame on. This is so bad. It's sort of like when he hears the story of the woman and what happens, it's sort of like it trips a trigger in his mind. This, this is the limit. This is the last straw, so to speak. And so he decides he's going to do something about it. And he sends a man to go to take Elijah's head off of him. To kill him. To put him to death. But as that man is on the way, you understand that the king then follows after. Now, why it is that he blamed Elisha? Could it be because Elisha is the one who counseled him before you need to let the army of Syria go back? Let them go and he could have killed them all. And, and now look, this army, they've come back and they're surrounding us and, and we're suffering. Or had Elisha promised and said, God's going to deliver us, just hang on, just, just stay the course, everything's going to be okay. But now the king is saying to himself, where is God? God's not going to deliver us. And so he's blaming Elisha for what has unfolded. And as he and his man are going that way, Elisha tells the elders of the city who are there with him to hold the door, to bar the door so that man cannot get in and do what the king has sent him to do. And when the king catches up, evidently the king either has had a change of mind or what Elisha says stays his hand, so to speak, because he doesn't kill Elisha at this point. But he gets there and he tells the king that he needs to hold on one more day. One more day, because tomorrow there is going to be relief. That you're going to be able to buy 
flour, two seas of flour will be sold for a shekel, or rather a sea of flour for a shekel, and two seas of barley for a shekel. Again, a shekel about $12 or so, and a sea is around 12 to 15 pounds. So a dollar or less per pound for fine flour, 50 cents or less per pound for barley. So this would have been more than they normally would have paid for it, but it's a lot better than paying $1,000 for a donkey head. So they're going to have food that's going to be plentiful the next day, he said, about this time. Well, then the king's officer responds to that and says, you know, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, that seems to be a reference back to the flood when God opened up the windows of heaven and the water poured down. He's saying, you know, if God made windows in heaven and just poured grain down, how could this even be? He cannot imagine it at this point because of how bad things are and how could it so quickly turn around in just one day. And so he tells that man, you're going to see it, but you won't participate in it. You won't partake of it. Well, let's draw a couple of lessons out of this account so far. First of all, let's think about the degradation of sin. How terrible sin really is. The siege that has come upon this city is because of their sin, their rebellion, them being involved in idolatry. And so the Lord has allowed Syrian, the Syrian army to come over and lay siege to them, to humble them, to bring them to their knees, which that has done in a physical sense. Well, go back to Leviticus chapter 26. Leviticus chapter 26. And let's notice where God had told them if you turn away from me, you're going to end up eating your sons and daughters. And he wasn't talking in a figurative sense. He was talking in a literal sense. In Leviticus chapter 26, verse 27, he says, And after this, if you do not obey me, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you in fury. And I, even I, will chasten or chastise you seven times for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons, and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters. We see in 2 Kings chapter 6 where that came to be a reality. That these mothers, and, and it's, it's hard for us to fathom how hungry would you have to be to boil and eat your own child. Everything that's involved in that. And I won't describe all of that, but if you let your mind dwell on that for a little bit, think about what that involves. And that's what she did. And it's very interesting that when she approached the king about this, it's like, it's nothing. It's, hey, we bought my son, we ate it. The next day I said, give me your son, she hit it. So tell her to give us her son. That, that's her attitude. That's, a picture of sin and where sin will take us and what sin does to us it drives us to do things that we would not think we would do it go it takes us farther than what we would imagine it puts us in extremely desperate circumstances it numbs the conscience what you could never have imagined before sin remaining in your life and staying there and hardening that heart will take you to a place you never imagined you could have gone before. And it leads to the most reprehensible behavior. <laughs> so what we need to do, we, we read this. This woman boiled and ate her own son. That's how we need to see sin. We look at that and think that is disgusting, that is awful, that is terrible. That's how we need to see sin. In Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, verse 9, the Apostle Paul put it this way, Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. We have to abhor sin. It needs to be utterly and totally disgusting to us. In 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2, remember the Apostle Peter wrote this, beginning in verse 20. 2 Peter 2, 20. 
For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. When we become a child of God and we go back into sin, he says it's like a dog returning to its vomit. You know, dogs will do that. Dogs will vomit and then they may do a turn or two. They'll just eat it right back up sometimes. Now let me ask you this. Would you do that yourself? You get sick. Your stomach starts feeling bad. You regurgitate. You vomit it out. Would you then get a spoon and start eating that back? When we think about sin, when we're tempted with sin, we need to think about eating our own vomit. Disgusting. No, I, I don't want anything to do with that makes me nauseous just to think about it. Think about cannibalism. Would you boil and eat your own child? That's how we need to view sin. Because that's what sin leads us to. Those things that are disgusting, that are degrading, that are absolutely shameful. Another lesson that we can learn out of this so far is this message of hope. Elisha gives this message of hope. He says... Just hold on one more day and everything's going to turn completely around. It will be different tomorrow. And we know that we can have hope in the most dire of circumstances in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. The Apostle writes this, And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. We go through hard times, we experience hard times. He's talking about this idea that there's a sense in which those trials can build you up and strengthen you and that gives you hope as you look forward to something that is there in the future that is promised to you. Trials are meant to strengthen our hope. And we need to believe in the power of God to deliver us. Not in human reasoning, not in human rationale because the officer there as he responded to Elisha, he's thinking as a man is thinking. And that's why he says, if the Lord were to make windows in heaven, would, would this be? Could this happen? Instead of believing in God and in His power, God's promises, let's understand, are based on evidence. When Elisha told him, you know, tomorrow this time, you're going to have flour, you're going to have barley, everything's going to be all right. When he told that, it wasn't a wish. It wasn't fanciful thinking on the part of Elisha. Elisha was telling these people, God is going to do this. Hear the word of the Lord, he said in 2 Kings 7 1. Hear what God is telling you. And then think about all that God had done in the past for his people. Would this be too hard for God to do, to turn it around completely in a day? Well, no, it's not too hard for God to do. There are millennia of promises where God has told His people He would deliver them, He would give them something, He would bless them in a particular way, and He did it again and again and again. And so this gives us hope in His Word. In Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, we want to understand that we have hope in God. We have the greatest hope of heaven. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, it says, And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now He has reconciled in the body of His flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in His sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. You've got this hope. He says, if, if you are grounded and steadfast, if you continue in the faith. Elisha was telling the king, he was telling his officer, he was telling the elders of the city and anybody else who heard that message, just hang on. Keep the faith. 
Continue. Press on. Because it's going to turn around. And we need to have that hope. We need to have that conviction that the promises God has made of the crown of life, of everlasting life, of dwelling in rest for eternity where there's no sorrow, no tears, no death. We need to hold on to that hope. But let's go back to 2 Kings now. 2 Kings chapter 7. Well, let's notice how it all unfolds beginning in verse 3. 2 Kings 7 verse 3. Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said to one another, Why are we sitting here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, the famine is in the city, and that we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now therefore, come let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall only die. And they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses, the noise of a great army. So they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Therefore they arose and fled at twilight and left the camp intact their tents, their horses, and their donkeys, and they fled for their lives. And when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into one tent and ate and drank and carried from it silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. Then they came back and entered another tent and carried some of from there also and went and hid it. Then they said to one another, We are not doing right. This day is a day of good news and we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now therefore come, let us go and tell the king's household. So they went and called to the gatekeepers of the city and told them, saying, We went to the Syrian camp and surprisingly no one was there, not a human sound, only horses and donkeys tied and the tents intact. And the gatekeepers called out and they told it to the king's household inside. So the king arose in the night and said to his servants, let me now tell you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we are hungry. Therefore they have gone out to the camp, out of the camp, to hide themselves in the field, saying, When they come out of the city, we shall catch them alive and get into the city. And one of his servants answered and said, Please let several men take five of the remaining horses which are left in the city. Look, they may either become like all the multitude of Israel that are left in it, or indeed, I say, they may become like the multitude of Israel left from those who are consumed. So let us send them and see. Therefore they took two chariots with horses, and the king sent them in the direction of the Syrian army, saying, Go and see. And they went after them to the Jordan, and indeed all the road was full of garments and weapons which the Syrians had thrown away in their haste. So the messengers returned and told the king. Then the people went out and plundered the tents of the Syrians, so a seah of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. Now the king had appointed the officer on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate. But the people trampled him in the gate, and he died, just as the men of God had said, who spoke when the king came down to him. So it happened just as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, Two seahs of barley for a shekel, and a seah of fine flour for a shekel shall be sold tomorrow about this time in the gate of Samaria. Then that officer had answered the king, or rather the man of God, and said, Now look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could such a thing be? And he said, In fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat it. And so it happened to him, for the people trampled him in the gate, and he died. It's interesting when you read about these lepers here. They're outside the city. That was per the law. They had to stay outside the city. And so they're out there and they're, they're caught between these two things. But they're suffering just as much as everybody else because it's not like they're just free to roam around. They're just stuck outside that city wall. So they reason among themselves, you know, if we stay here, we're going to die. If we go to the Syrians, maybe they'll take care of us. Maybe they'll have compassion. Maybe they'll give us a little bit of food. But if they don't and they kill us, well, we're just dead. We're just going to die already. So 
Let's take our chances. So it says they arose at twilight. That's at the evening twilight that they go out. And evidently they go around and circle around the Syrian camp because this takes a little time for them to get out there. But when they get out there, they realize that the Syrians are not there. That they're gone. The Assyrians had abandoned the camp and it explains to us the reason why is because the Lord made them hear the sound of chariots and the noise of horses. They thought there was a great army that was descending down and attacking them at that time. And so that sound that they heard was miraculous in some sense, in some way God making them hear something that wasn't there. Some type of miracle had taken place. But them leaving, them running away was a natural response. It's just a normal thing. Well, the lepers then go in. They find the first tent that they go into. There's food there. So they chow down. They eat. They fill their bellies. They see the goods there, the silver, the gold, the garments, the clothes. Hey, let's take some of this. So they take it and they hide it. Well, let's go back. They go back to the second tent. They do the same thing again. And then they feel guilty. They feel guilty that we're out here, we're enjoying this, people inside are suffering. They had friends, they had family, they had people they loved in the city, and they haven't said anything yet. And they decide, you know, if we keep doing this and we take advantage of it for ourselves, somehow we're going to get punished for this. <laughs> Something bad's going to happen to us, whether that's God punishing them, or eventually the city's going to find out, maybe they know we knew, and then they're going to punish us. They're going to be angry about it. But for whatever reason, they say, we need to go and we need to tell the people in the city. So they go, they tell the gatekeepers, the gatekeepers tell the king. The king suspects that this is a ruse by the Syrian army. They lure them out of the city so they can finally take them. But they go out, they find that the report is true. And everything it says unfolded just like Elisha, the man of God, had told them. A sea of flour for 12 shekels, two seas of barley for a shekel, rather, for a shekel. And so the king's officer then was put in charge of that gate and he was trampled to death. And when we read that, we read one account and then we read the second account. It's like the author of Second Kings just repeats that. But why would he do that? He did it to emphasize. Look, it happened exactly like Elisha said. Exactly. So that side of the message he gave that said there's hope, there's going to be food. You're going to be able to eat. Everything's going to be okay. That was absolutely true. And then the other side of where this man would see it, but he wouldn't partake of it, was absolutely true as well. Let's think about this. First of all, the idea that God's power is unlimited. We go to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Verses 20 and 21. Let's read this here. Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21. The Apostle Paul says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. You know, there are times when... We can't see how it's going to work out. We can't see or understand how could this situation change. But God's power is unlimited. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. In Matthew chapter 6, remember that Jesus had said this in Matthew 6, verse 31 beginning, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and these things shall be added to you. God is able to provide us with the things that we need. Sometimes we don't have everything we want. We're going through a trial to learn lessons, to humble us, to teach us. Sometimes that is taking place. But God knows our needs and He tells us what we need to focus on is His kingdom and His righteousness. Trust that God will care for us today and God will care for us tomorrow. We need to trust 
in that. The other thing that I want us to notice is in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, is that we are under siege by Satan. The Assyrian army had surrounded Samaria, laid siege to them, and brought great suffering on them. And let's understand that that is what Satan attempts to do to us and tries to do to us, to lay siege to us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, Paul just makes mention of this, lest we should, Satan should take advantage of this, for we are not ignorant of his devices. He's watching, he's waiting, he's trying to wear us down, he's trying to cause us difficulty and pain and suffering, he's trying to trip us up, he's trying to tempt us, to get us to give up and to give in. But the gospel, of course, has a message of hope. The gospel tells us that we need to stay strong. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, he says, Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. We need to be watching for Satan, aware of him. But he says, stand fast in the faith. You know, when Elisha gave that message of hope, and he told the king and the others, that it was going to turn, turn around, it was going to change. There were some who listened and believed in that and held on for another day. And then, of course, there was the man, the officer, who did not. We need to trust in the promises of God and understand that when we are under siege by Satan, that there is deliverance that is coming. That we are not to give in, to give up, on God and what He has told us is going to be. In Romans chapter 13, verse 11. Romans 13, verse 11. The Apostle writes this. And do this, knowing the time, that it is now high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Saying we need to focus on faithfulness to God. Because there is that time of judgment that is coming. And we see in that account of the officer that if we doubt that, that if we question that, that that doubt leads to death. We have to believe in God and zealously pursue Him, diligently seeking Him. Otherwise, we are going to end up losing our souls. Remember in Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 3, that the Hebrew writer takes us back to the children of Israel and the time that they had doubt. When they went up to the land of Canaan and they doubted that God could take them in and give them the victory and deliver that land into their hand, that they ended up being punished for that. And in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, he says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. He goes on in verse 16 to say this, For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, with whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Their unbelief led them to disobedience. But that is that doubt of God's promise, that doubt of God's power that leads to that death, to that destruction. And so we are to take caution, to take heed. Don't give up. Though we're under siege by Satan, though he is after us, though we may be facing difficulties as we're laid under siege by Satan, we should not give up. We have to keep going. We have to have patience as essentially Elijah was counseling the king because the king had asked, 
Why should I wait? Why should I wait any longer? Why should I do that? Then, of course, Elisha explains that to him. Let's go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And notice what the Apostle Paul says about this. Philippians chapter 4, verse 10 beginning. Philippians 4, verse 10. He says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, but I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everything in an, or everywhere and in all things I have lear learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We need to have patience and learn to sacrifice and to suffer. We want to avoid it. And our society essentially tells us you should avoid suffering and sacrifice at all costs. You should think about yourself, take care of yourself, you know, self-care. There's all kinds of things about that. And I understand there's an element of where, you know, we need to make sure we're strong, spiritually strong, we're doing what's right so we can help others. But you know what? There is an element of suffering and sacrifice that is beneficial to us. It helps us to understand God and His help in our life and the fact that we need Him in our life. Our life depends on Him. So don't give up. Don't give up. You know, the, the people there in Samaria... They were ready to give up. The king was ready to give up. His officer had given up. And relief was just the next day. Here's the thing. We don't know when the Lord's going to return. When is the deliverance exactly coming? We don't know. He's coming like a thief in the night. But the deliverance is coming. We have that promise. So hold on. Be patient. Endure. You will open to number 830. 8.30. 8.30. There is no situation or circumstance in which we find ourselves that is more desperate, that is more dire than being enslaved to sin. When we're enslaved to sin, it presses down our mind with guilt and it eats away at the soul like a cancer. But we need to be reminded that there's no power that delivers us except God's power. And His power delivers us abundantly. It lifts our mind out of despair and it fills our soul with joy and with hope. So we encourage you today. If you're in those dire circumstances that Satan is laying siege to you, or maybe he has gotten you, then you need to turn to the Lord. You need to look to Him. You need to call out to Him to be delivered from that. If you're a child of God and you've weakened and you've wavered, there's things you need to change in your life, there's sin in your life of which you need to repent, then won't you do that today? If you never obeyed the gospel, you're at the age of accountability, then Satan has you in his clutches. He has you in that state of where you are spiritually dead and you are doomed. But you can have life. You can be delivered from that. And so won't you do that? Won't you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Confess it before this audience. Be determined that you're going to turn away from your sins and forsake those things that have put you in that condition. And then be baptized to have your sins washed away. If you're ready to do that, you need to turn to the Lord today. Come forward while we stand and sing.